Well, hello there, guys. Welcome to Political Fight Club. I'm Robert Durden. And in this episode, we're going to be covering part one of chapter three of Black Shirts and Reds. This chapter is called Left Anti-Communism, which that may seem kind of like a, uh, you know, an oxymoron of sorts. What it would translate to today is boutique leftism. And you guys have heard me talk about this constantly on my show. No one goes after boutique left ideology, meaning either they proclaim to be lefty, but they're still capitalist or still imperialist. That's boutique leftism, generally. And they happen to attack most people that I agree with who are more, you know, Marxist, uh, Leninist, which that's what I am. And this chapter is going to be talking about how those people operate, how they smear communism, and how they frame everything around the idea that Russia's bad, communism bad. So as you can see, it's um, pretty poignant for what's going on right now. And it's pretty amazing because this book came out in 1997. So it's a 25-year-old book. And Parenti absolutely nails exactly what's going on right now in a new McCarthyite era. So whenever they talk about left anti-communism in this chapter, just substitute boutique left. That's what boutique left is. And uh, it will make a lot of sense, and it's going to ring very true, as it did with me when I read it this morning. So um, let's start here on page 41. Left anti-communism. In the United States, for over a hundred years, the ruling interests tirelessly propagated anti-communism along the populace until it became more like a religious orthodoxy than political analysis. During the Cold War, the anti-communist ideological framework could transform any data about existing communist societies into hostile evidence. If the Soviets refused to negotiate a point, they were intransigent and belligerent. If they appeared willing to make concessions, this was but a skillful ploy to put us off our guard. By opposing arms limitations, they would have demonstrated their aggressive intent. But when in fact they supported most armament treaties, it was because they were mendacious and manipulative. If the churches in the USSR were empty, this demonstrated that religion was suppressed. But if the churches were full, this meant that the people were rejecting the regime's atheism. If the workers went on strike, as happened on infrequent occasions, this was evidence of their alienation from the collectivist system. If they didn't go on strike, this was because they were intimidated and lacked freedom. A scarcity of consumer goods demonstrated the failure of the economic system. An improvement in consumer supplies meant only that the leaders were attempting to placate a restive, a restive population and so maintain a firmer hold over them. Sound a little bit like what's going on right now? If communists in the U.S. played an important role struggling for the rights of workers, the poor, African Americans, women, and others, this was only their guileful way of ga gathering support among disenfranchised groups and gaining power for themselves. How one gained power by fighting for the rights of the powerless was never really explained. What we are dealing with is a non-falsifiable orthodoxy so assiduously marketed by the ruling interests that affected people across the entire political spectrum. Genuflection to Orthodoxy Many on the U.S. left have exhibited a Soviet bashing and red baiting that matches anything on the right in its enmity and crudity. Listen to Noam Chomsky holding forth about quote-unquote left intellectuals who try to quote rise to power on the backs of mass popular movements and then beat the people into submission, you start off as basically a Leninist who is going to be part of the red bureaucracy. You see later that power doesn't lie that way and you're very quickly become an ideologist of the right. We're seeing it right now and for the former Soviet Union. The same guys who were communist thugs two years back are now running banks and are enthusiastic free marketeers and praising Americans. That's from Z Magazine in 95. Chomsky's imagery is heavily indebted to the same US corporate political culture he so frequently criticizes on other issues. In his mind, the revolution was betrayed by a coterie of communist thugs who merely hunger for power rather than wanting the power to end the hunger. In fact, the communists did not very quickly switch to the right, but struggled in the face of a or momentous onslaught to keep the Soviet socialism alive for more than 70 years. To be sure, 
in the Soviet Union's waning days some, like Boris Yeltsin, crossed over to the capitalist ranks, but others continued to resist free market incursions at great cost to themselves, many meeting their deaths during Yeltsin's violent repression of the Russian parliament in 93. Some leftists and others fall back on the old stereotype of power-hungry Reds who pursue power for power's sake without regard for actual social goals. If true, one wonders why, in country after country, these Reds side with the poor and powerless, often at great risk and sac sacrifice to themselves, rather than reaping the rewards that come with serving the well-placed. And that's kind of the division right there between the boutique left and the actual left in this country, isn't it, guys? couple of us will always fight for the powerless and the poor disenfranchised while the others will pretend to while enriching themselves and connecting themselves with people that are higher up so that they can get more money more stature more power but I digress for decades many left-leaning writers and speakers in the United States have felt obliged to establish their credibility by indulging in anti-communist and anti-soviet genuflection seemingly unable to give a talk or write an article or a book review on whatever political subject without injecting some sort of anti-red sideswipe. The intent was, and still is, to distance themselves from the Marxist-Leninist left, which that's what I am. I am a Marxist-Leninist. Adam Hochschild, a liberal writer and publisher, warned those on the left who might be lackadaisical about condemning existing com communist societies that they, quote-unquote, weakened their credibility. It's from The Guardian in 84. In other words, to be credible opponents of the Cold War, we first had to join in Cold War condemnations of communist societies. Ronald Rodosh, uh, Radosh urged that the peace movement purge itself of communists so that it not be accused of being communist. If I understand, Radosh, to save ourselves from anti-communist witch hunts, we should ourselves become witch hunters. Purging the left of communists became a long-standing practice, having injurious effects on various progressive causes. For instance, in 1949, some 12 unions were ousted from the CIO because they had reds in their leadership. Now, the CIO is the Congress of Industrial Organizations. The purge reduced CIO membership by some 1.7 million and seriously weakened its recruitment drives and political clout. In the late 40s, to avoid being smeared as Reds, Americans for Democratic Action, the ADA, a supposedly progressive group, became one of the most vocally anti-communist organizations. Sound like anybody you guys know today? I'm sure a bunch of names are coming to, you, to your mind right now. The strategy did not work. ADA and others on the left were still attacked for being communist or soft on communism by those on the right. Then and now, Many on the left have failed to realize that those who fight for social change on behalf of the less privileged elements of society will be red-baited by conservative elites, whether they are communists or not. For ruling interests, it makes little difference whether their wealth and power is challenged by quote-unquote communist subversives or quote loyal American liberals. All are lumped together as more or less equally abhorrent. Even when attacking the right, left critics cannot pass up an opportunity to flash their anti-communist credentials. So Mark Green writes in a criticism of President Reagan that, quote, when presented with a situation that challenges his conservative catechism, like an unyielding Marxist-Leninist, Reagan will change not his mind, but the facts. While professing a dedication to fighting dogmatism, both on the left and the right, Individuals per who perform such de rigueur genuflections reinforce the anti-communist dogma. Red-baiting leftists contributed their share to the climate of hostility that has given us U.S. leaders such a free hand in waging hot and cold wars against communist countries and which, even today, makes a progressive or even liberal agenda difficult to promote. A prototypic red basher who pretended to be on the left was George Orwell, in the middle of World War II, as the Soviet Union was fighting for its life against the Nazi invaders at Stalingrad, Orwell announced that, quote, willingness to criticize Russia and Stalin is the test of intellectual honesty. It is the only thing that, from a literary intellectual's point of view, is really dangerous. Safely ensconced 
within a virulently anti-communist society, Orwell, with Orwellian doublethink, characterized the condemnation of communism as a lonely, courageous act of defiance. Today, his ideological progeny are still at it, offering themselves as intrepid left critics of the left, waging a valiant struggle against imaginary Marxist-Leninist-Stalinist hordes. Sorely lacking within the U.S. left is any rational evaluation of the Soviet Union, a nation that endured and protracted a protracted civil war and a multinational foreign invasion in its very first years of existence, and that two decades later threw back and destroyed the Nazi beast at enormous cost to itself. In the three decades after the Bolshevik Revolution, the Soviets made industrial advances equal to what capitalism took a century to accomplish, while feeding and schooling their children rather than working them 14 hours a day as capitalist industrialists did not do in many parts of the world. And the Soviet Union, along with Bulgaria, the German Democratic Republic, and Cuba, provided vital assistance to national liberation movements in countries around the world, including Nelson Mandela's African National Congress in South Africa. Left anti-communists remain studiously unimpressed by the dramatic gains won by masses of previously impoverished people under communism. Some were even scornful of such accomplishments. I recall how in Burlington, Vermont in 1971, the noted anti-communist anarchist Murray Bookchin derisively referred to my concern for, quote, the poor little children who got fed under communism. His exact words. Slinging labels. And this is the most important part here, guys. This is, um exactly what's going on nowadays. Those of us who refused to join in the Soviet bashing were branded by left anti-communists as Soviet apologists and Stalinists, or in today were Putin puppets, right? Even if we disliked Stalin or Putin and his autocratic system of rule and believed there were things seriously wrong with existing Soviet society, our real sin was that unlike many on the left, we refused to uncritically swallow the U.S. media propaganda about communist societies. Instead, we maintained that aside from the well-publicized deficiencies and injustices, there were positive features about existing communist systems that were worth preserving, that improved the lives of hundreds of millions of people in meaningful and humanizing ways. This claim had a decidedly unsettling effect on left anti-communists, who themselves could not, not utter a positive word about any communist society except for possibly Cuba, and did not lend a tolerant or even courteous ear to anyone who did. Saturated by anti-communist orthodoxy, most U.S. leftists have practiced a left McCarthyism against people who did have something positive to say about existing communism, excluding them from participation in conferences, advisory boards, political endorsements, and left publications. Like conservatives, left anti-communists tolerated nothing left, less than a blanket condemnation of the Soviet Union as a Stalinist monstrosity and a Leninist moral aberration. That many U.S. leftists have scant familiarity with Lenin's writings and political work does not prevent them from slinging the Leninist label. Noam Chomsky, who is an inexhaustibly inexhaustible fount of anti-communist caricatures, offers this comment about Le Leninism. Quote, Western and also third world intellectuals were attracted to the Bolshevik counter-revolution because Leninism is, after all, a doctrine that says that the radical intelligentsia have the right to take state power and run their countries by force. And that is an idea which is rather appealing to intellectuals. Here, Chomsky fashions an image of power-hungry intellectuals to go along with his cartoon image of power-hungry Leninists, villains seeking not the revolutionary means to fight injustice, but power for power's sake. When it comes to the red-baiting and red-bashing, some of the best and brightest on the left sound not much better than the worst on the right. At the time of the 1996 terror bombing in Oklahoma City, I heard a radio commentator announce, quote, Lenin said that the purpose of terror is to terrorize. U.S. media commentators have repeatedly quoted Lenin in that misleading manner. In fact, his statement was disapproving of terrorism. 
He polemicized against isolated terrorist acts, which do nothing but create terror amongst the populace, invite repression, and isolate the revolutionary movement from the masses. Far from being a totalitarian, tight-circled conspirator, Lenin urged the building of broad coalitions and mass organizations, encompassing people who were at different levels of political development. He advocated whatever diverse means were needed to advance the class struggle, including participation in parliamentary elections and existing trade unions. To be sure, the working class, like any mass group, needed organization and leadership to wage a successful revolutionary struggle, which was the role of a vanguard party. But that did not mean the proletarian revolution could be fought and won by putschists or terrorists. And a putschist is um, someone who wants to take over state power using force and violence. Lenin constantly dealt with the problem of avoiding the two extremes of liberal bourgeoisie opportunism and ultra-left adventurism. Yet he himself is repeatedly identified as an ultra-left putschist by mainstream journalists and some on the left. Whether Lenin's approach to revolution is desirable or even relevant today is a question that warrants critical examination, but a useful evaluation is not likely to come from people who misrepresent his theory and practice. And Kalinsky has done this before as well. He is definitely a bashed Marxist Leninism. Left anti-communists find any association with communist organizations morally unacceptable because of the quote, crimes of communism yet many of them are themselves associated with the Democratic Party in this country, either as voters or as members, apparently unconcerned about the morally unacceptable political crimes committed by leaders of that organization. Under one or another Democratic administration, 120,000 Japanese Americans were torn from their homes and livelihoods and thrown into detention camps. Atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki with an enormous loss of innocent life. The FBI was given authority to infiltrate political groups. The Smith Act was used to imprison leaders of the Trotskyist Socialist Workers Party and later on leaders of the Communist Party for their political beliefs. Detention camps were established to round up political dissidents in the event of a national emergency. During the late 40s and 50s, 8,000 federal workers were purged from government uh, perched from the government because of their political associations and views with thousands more in all walks of life which hunted from their careers. The Neutrality Act was used to impose an embargo on the Spanish Republic that worked in favor of Franco's fascist legions. Homicidal counterinsurgency programs were initiated in various third world countries and the Vietnam War was pursued and escalated. And for the better part of a century the congressional leadership of the Democratic Party protected racial segregation and stymied all anti-lynching and fair employment bills. Yet all these crimes, bringing ruination and death to many, have not moved the li liberals, the social democrats, and the democratic socialist anti-communists to insist repeatedly that we issue blanket condemnations of either the Democratic Party or the political system that produced it, certainly not with the intolerant fervor that has been directed against existing communism. So we will read the second part of chapter three later. That is an extremely poignant first part of a chapter. It's ringing true today, 25 years after it was published. So I'm loving this book so far. Thank you again for all the people that recommended it to me. We will finish up chapter three tomorrow. Keep fighting that good fight out there, guys. Talk to you later.